Today we're speaking with Drs. Elizabeth Blackburn and Carol Greider. Dr. Blackburn is the 2010-2011 President of the AACR and the Morris Herstein Professor of Biology and Physiology in the Department of Biochemistry and Biophysics in the University of California, San Francisco. Dr. Greider is the Daniel Nathans Professor and Director of Molecular Biology and Genetics in the Johns Hopkins Institute of Basic and Biomedical Sciences. Dr. Blackburn and Dr. Greider are the recipients of the 2009 Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine for the discovery of how chromosomes are protected by telomeres and the enzyme telomerase. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. So what was it like when you first heard that you received the Nobel Prize? Carol, you start. <laughs> Um, it was uh, really a thrill. Uh, the phone rang at uh, 5 o'clock in the morning, and uh, that morning time for me is usually my time for, uh, for exercise. So I was uh, waiting to go to my spin class, and I was finishing up folding the laundry from the night before that had been left over when I, when I got the call. Um, and so I had to put off my, my spin class that day <laughs> uh, because a lot of other things happened. Uh, and then shortly thereafter, I got a call from Liz. <laughs> I knew I had to get my call into Carol quick because her lo phone lines were going to be swamped and uh, I too was woken up but it was even worse in terms of earliness because I was not awake. I was, uh, it was 2 a.m. and uh, my husband and I were both groping for the phone and, uh, and uh, both thinking that my 95 year old uh, mother-in-law might have had something happen because we just finished our weekend family get together to celebrate her birthday so that oh. was in my mind. Anyway, so I can tell you the news was so much better, and, uh, and uh, I was very kindly advised by the uh, Karolinska committee chair to, as he said, I'd advise you to have a cup of coffee. <laughs> he was so right. <laughs> what was it like when you were working together and when you made this discovery? Well, I was so lucky because Carol was just such a fantastic student, and uh, this, you know, this is how things happen, is uh, terrific people do science and uh, Carol was such a joy to have as a student because she was so smart and so able to move ahead in ways that often people find difficult. Carol was able to always move ahead and always be thinking about what is it that's important and how does one sort of harness the impetus to make things move ahead. So it was a total joy having Carol as, as a student and I think we probably talked almost every day mm. and really enjoyed this very collaborative, interactive uh, thing. It, it was really fun, it was like solving a puzzle, you know, coming in, uh, Liz had proposed that there were maybe this enzyme telomerase, but we didn't know how to find it or anything about it. And so it was like an exciting puzzle. And, and we would come in and uh, yeah. try one thing, and then I'd talk to Liz, and then we'd try something else. And sometimes she would have a different idea than, than I did. And I remember one time when we were talking in the lab where I wanted to do an experiment in a particular way, and she said, no, I should do it this way, and we had this discussion, and then by the time I came into the lab the next morning, we had both switched sides, <laughs> yes. and she wanted to yes. do it this way, and I wanted to do it that That's way. Right. That's right. <laughs> so those are the kinds of conversations that, that we would have. Right. And then there was the doubt time, where sometimes you'd say, oh my God, there's going to be this terrible artifact that's going to explain all this away, and you know, I'd be depressed one day, and Carol would be full of hope, and then the next day, it would be you know, the other way around, and so very, very mm -hmm. interactive and back and forth, and I think that's very important because it's such a dynamic sort of iterative process is how you know how, how you make things move forward. When you were uh, doing this research did you have an idea that it would have such a significant impact on the field? Well yes and no. Um, you know we were working in uh, Tetrahymena where Liz had first uh, discovered the sequence of the telomeres and this is a single-celled pond animal um, and so when we uh, discovered telomerase and realized that this is what's needed to maintain chromosome ends, we didn't have any particular disease application in mind. Uh, we didn't know about human chromosomes or cancer or age-related disease, but we did know that fundamental mechanisms inside cells are conserved. So on the one hand, we knew it was really important, but we didn't know what those implications exactly would be. Yes, yeah, and the obscure biological system was chosen because it had these experimental advantages 
but we never thought of it as being something off the planet, you know, that wasn't going to relate to the rest of um, organisms, because I think the culture, especially in molecular biology, had really become to recognize that the fundamental principles, both molecularly and, as we know, in lots of ways for cells, really held across all sorts of different organisms. You just dived into whatever system would let you have the experimental advantage. But, you know, I, I mean, when Carol found the first really clear visual evidence of telomerase, she'd already seen her data and knew it was big, and as soon as she showed this data, I had this, I know this is big sense. You know, there was something important there. And then, of course, we had to dive in and think of all the reasons why we might be uh, deluded. And uh, so we were going to have to address them all. But I think we knew that it was sort of unlikely that it was um, just going to be an artifact. Didn't you think? There was enough going for it, biologically speaking. There were enough things about the setting in which the enzyme activity was particularly strong that it had that ring of this is going to have to be pretty unlikely to be an artifact to meet these criteria that it was But then meeting. it was fun actually yeah. being in the lab because there was something to assay. We had evidence for an enzyme. Something and so you could come in yes. every day and do mm. a different experiment. Yes. Yes. And so every day you got a little bit of reward of an answer as opposed to the nine yes. months before that when you know, there really it, was no yes, answer. So the excitement. This restriction fragment and that restriction yeah, fragment. Yeah, the excitement went up. Exonuclease, remember there was a lot of steps before yep. the assay that really was the definitive one that enabled the enzyme to sort of be teased out of the morass of all the other mm -hmm. enzymatic activities that are in cells, and this was the one that sort of lured it out, right? Yeah, <laughs> and then and then we got to participate in you know later on in the you know following our curiosity to find out well what are the implications? Yes. So we didn't yes. know what the implications were then, but of course that then became a question for us, and so then we asked what happens if you don't have telomerase, and yes. that then yes. led us to the cancer question and and yes. the role of uh, of telomeres in cancer. Answer. So it's, it was sort of a, yeah. a progressive uh, path. What if happens if you have too much telomerase, mm -hmm. which is what cancer cells as it started to emerge, mm -hmm. you know, in the decade after we first, first, very first got the activity evidence, right? And then the following decade in the early 90s, it really started emerging. This was being a pattern in human cancers. And, and then the, all the questions that arose from that, not least, well, would this be a useful thing to uh, be able to exploit, uh, knowing this is going on in the biology of cancers, as well as being very intellectually exciting to say, ah, this is solving a problem here, because there had been this really, really major problem in how a telomeres, first of all, even molecularly protecting the ends of mm -hmm. chromosomes, and how are they solving this very fundamental DNA replication problem? So it was great fun because it had these different sort of key aspects to mm -hmm. it as a question and then more and more you could see the you know relationship to what's going on in cancer. So what do you see as the future of telomere research? Well you know every time we uh, answer a particular question that we set out we're going to try and understand one aspect of telomeres a number of other questions <laughs> open up um, and you know I wouldn't have known that I would be working on today if you'd asked me six years ago, you know, what are you going to be working on? Yes. Because the field just keeps changing. Um, but there are still really fundamental questions. You know, we know that telomeres are involved in um, allowing the continued growth of tumor cells, and they're also um, essential for uh, normal cell division, and so there's this link to age-related diseases. So both of those disease aspects um, are very exciting, and there are still many fundamental aspects of the actual telomere itself, what are the proteins, where do they interact, uh, who touches who in terms of the uh, the molecules yeah. and when, that are going to be dynamically and, and too exactly right. and dynamics of it and really, those are going to be relevant yeah. to all of these yes. disease questions. So yeah. the disease questions are very interesting, but there's still a lot of fundamentals. I would say there are more questions now than when we set out <laughs> to look at yes. telomeres. But that's the way research is. You have to ask the question in a very kind of almost blinded way. You have to laser-like focus on things, mm -hmm. knowing that of course there's going to be complexity, but. First of all, you have to kind of just focus right in. And then when you've got something solid, right, or concrete, then you can start adding the, letting the complexity come in. But again, you can't be overwhelmed by the complexity. You have to sort of now say, well, I'm going to ask about the complexity in a certain way. And again, uh, 
you know, that will take you a certain distance. And then you say, well, okay, now I have to think of these other aspects. I mean, I love the idea of bringing very exciting, new, cutting-edge technologies to, you know, the, the dynamics of how telomeres work. It's nothing in a cell is static. Mm -hmm. Telomerase is not static. You know, we think of it f mentally in terms of static things, because that's what we have our hands on with the current and older technologies, but now the technologies are moving. We can now ask the questions in whole different ways and bring clinical um, collaborations in, as both of us have done. Mm -hmm. And we've loved that aspect of now bringing, you know, our basic science, their clinical uh, you know, depth of understanding of what goes on and, and having that exciting intersection. At the interfaces where new yeah. things Somebody uh, said really sparks discovered. fly at interfaces. I love mm -hmm. that, right? Mm -hmm. But I mean good sparks, not bad sparks. <laughs> Drs. Blackburn and Greider, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank Great you.